Hi, welcome to Wellness. I'm your host, Linda Lonigan, Senior Clinical Nutritionist. I'm here to show you the very best your community has to offer in health, fitness, well-being, amazing events, and amazing people. Today, I am joined by the amazing Ajamu Ayende. Welcome, Ajamu. Thank you so much for having me here. Yes. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> so tell me, as a uh, hypnotherapist, how did it all begin? That's a really good question. I have to say it began in utero. My mother and father were interested in hypnosis for childbirth. So they found a book on natural hypnosis uh -huh. written by a medical doctor okay. in 1968. Okay. So they practiced the techniques and according to my mother, she was able to give birth without so much as an aspirin. So wow. it's a very, very peaceful experience very much unlike what we see on television and in the movies uh -huh. as, as it relates to hypnosis and right. as it relates to childbirth. Right, right. And, and you have so many levels of what you apply as a medical hypnotherapist. Can you get, share with us and my viewers? As a medical hypnotherapist, what we're looking to do is address issues that normally one would go to see a doctor for. It doesn't mean that we're replacing the doctor. We're working in collaboration with a medical doctor or in some cases a dentist. So many times people have anxiety about an upcoming procedure, whether it's a simple procedure like getting their teeth cleaned or whether it's something far more serious like open heart surgery. Hypnosis is very, very useful in helping people to relieve anxiety, but also accelerate the healing process. I had the great fortune of working in a plastic surgery center with a holistic plastic surgeon for a number of years. And she was a fan of hypnosis, and so she hired me to be the staff hypnotherapist. Wow. And I did a lot to prepare many of her patients before they went under the knife. And then on the back end, when they were uh, done with their actual treatment, getting them back to their activities of daily living, they call it. Mm -hmm. That's something hypnosis mm -hmm. is very useful for. Interesting. And you also share with me that you also have another degree. Um, I do. Hypnosis is not a degree as such. I've right. been certified in hypnosis since 1995. Right. Had some excellent teachers all over, across the U.S. I always like to give credit to my teachers. Uh, my mom was my first teacher of hypnosis, though, because after she learned about hypnosis, she went and got some certification of her own. So mm -hmm. she was the first person to show me mm -hmm. hypnosis. But mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't see it as a career. I didn't know it was something one could do for a living right. because my mom worked as a counselor with youth. For me, I wanted to have something that would allow me to work with kids, and I chose sports psychology. I, I became a school teacher out of college, but I found that the traditional models of therapy were right. something that many of the kids in the inner city where I was teaching right. were not really comfortable with. So being a social worker or being a psychologist, it, it was difficult for them to speak the language, it seemed, of, right. of my kids. Sure. So sports psychology was something that would give me some of that technique, but it would also give me something that they felt they wanted. Right. So many of the, the boys that I would work with were interested in being better basketball players or football players or getting a scholarship or something like that. Right. And we would talk about performance enhancement, but then I'd sneak in something about anger management or I'd sneak in something about having them get a little bit better grades and right. that kind of thing. Well done. Mm. Well done. I know what you're talking about as far as the environment because I, I was born in Brooklyn mm. and brought up in Queens. Yeah, I so Brooklyn. I know I, mm. I can clearly understand what you're you're sharing. It's a very interesting uh, approach that you're sharing mm. as far as working with, uh, with their performance through their means, identifying what their interests are or what their hobbies are and then interplaying. Right. You know, it's um, all about being client-centered. Interesting. Very interesting. And how many different groups do you apply being a medical hypnotherapist to? Well, I, I want to frame it a little bit differently. I'm a certified medical hypnotherapist, sure. but I'm also a master mental coach. And that's right. where I use the skills that I have in terms of neurolinguistic programming right. and in terms of sports psychology, cognitive behavioral therapy. Right. And I'm also a trainer of hypnotherapists. I'm right. a transpersonal hypnotherapy trainer. Right. So I was blessed to have some really good teachers, as I said, and I became a certified trainer of hypnosis in 1998. So I've had the great fortune of traveling across the country teaching hypnosis. I've been invited to England to teach hypnosis. I've been invited to Canada Wonderful. to teach hypnosis. And even a medical school in, in Atlanta had me come in and teach. 
Wonderful. Wow. So, it's such an honor to there's, have you there, on today. There's, there's a lot of different areas where hypnosis can help. When I got started in 1995, I was a school teacher at the time. Uh -huh. So I saw hypnosis as something that could be used in the classroom, right. something that could be used in after school programs. And my, my, my undergraduate degree was in multicultural education. And I got a chance to study the educational system in what was in the Soviet Union and Japan. And those countries were using right. hypnosis in the classroom. So I felt wow. validated. In sure. being able to, to actually get that in a classroom setting. Because I had been using hypnosis all my life. You have? Yeah. Wow. And you mentioned to me um, specifically in this day and age as far as these young kids that are addicted to these video games mm. that are in their rooms that are, are not. And you also address that with your tremendous expertise and all the versatility and levels. Do, do you see people that have problems? Well, there's there addiction? are a couple of things at play here. Uh, we, when we talk about addictions, right. whether it's food addictions, right. whether it's drinking, whether it's drugs, right. these are things that are very amenable to hypnotherapy because right. there's a physical as well as a psychological component. Uh, the, the challenging thing with addictions to Video games is they don't think it's an addiction. Interesting. They don't realize it's an addiction. They think, like a lot of addicts, I could stop any time if I wanted to, or it's right. not a big deal. It's it's not hurting me. Right. One of the things that I've noticed is that people who are isolated tend to be at risk for addiction, mm -hmm. and people who are addicts tend to isolate. So it's a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. So many of our young people are not developing very good social skills uh -huh. because they are immersed in this fantasy world right. and there may sometimes be interaction with other people right. via the xbox or whatever it is right. but it's not true intimacy it's not true communication it's not true interaction so um, one of the ways to help kids get free of these video games is to help them to develop social skills uh -huh. help them to develop some self-love too okay that's interesting so uh, can you give me an example of that first step as far as initiation of self-love or identification and, and getting out of that in, in, in social uh, Well, so, sometimes I, I think that um, there are people who, let's say, smoke cigarettes mm -hmm. and they think, oh, that's perfectly fine. It's not a big deal. But when they start to see that people are getting rich from their, quote, addiction, if they see that there are chemicals that they weren't aware of that were being put in, if, if they're able to see that there's maybe more going on than they had previously thought, then it becomes something that comes from them. So one of the things that unfortunately I deal with all the time with hypnosis is people think of brainwashing when they think of hypnosis. And no one wants to feel as if they're being controlled. Right. One of the ways that I've helped some young people to get free from their addiction to video games is to, to help them to understand the level of control that these games and that these game makers are exercising in their lives. Mm -hmm. So instead of it being their parents saying you need to stop or their teachers or the therapist person, they're saying, you know, they're 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 sucking me dry. They're 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 vampires on some level. Because many of the games are free, but then there are all kinds of add on things that one can purchase in the context of the game. So maybe you, you don't really notice because it's a right. dollar here, it's 25 cents there, it's five bucks here, but you need all these things in order to complete the missions. Right. Uh, so I, I help them to see what's really going on in terms of how they're being treated or mistreated. Mm -hmm. And part of it is the music that is very, very hypnotic that plays in the background of most video games. And when we study uh, psychology, we understand that the human body wants to entrain to whatever sounds there are, that natural heartbeat, the ocean, uh, a very simple drum beat. These are all things that we know can induce a trance state. So when these uh, loops of music are playing hour after hour after hour, day upon day, week upon week, there is a way that they become zombified with, without it wow. really being their fault. It's, it's wow. not something that we have to blame them for. Right. They're being pulled into this world that is so much better than their world. They're, they're given skills, they're given tools, abilities that they don't have. So they're able to exercise more control over, they perceive more right. control over this artificial environment. Right. Meanwhile, they're not developing the skills that they need to function in their own actual reality. And so valuable. 
so so valuable and so interesting and you shared with me earlier that this um the whole idea of hypnotherapy began very 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 young very yes. early yes um and i see you have three books here to show that in terms oh, thank that you. It, it started I, in i have this tie on today that had i don't know if the camera can pick it up but it is a tie that has a, a very interesting bookcase with lots and lots of books on it. So I'm a little bit of a nerd. <laughs> I, I think you can identify. I'm a nerd too. Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, whenever I, I give lots of presentations at a lot of different hospitals. So I've given presentations at uh, St. Luke's Cornwall and you know various hospitals around here. But I like to bring books with me written by doctors and dentists because many times the biggest thing that I run against when I'm talking with medical professionals is that hypnosis is woo-woo. Hypnosis is something, quote, alternative. But this book was written in 1958 by a dentist. And the title of the book is Clinical Applications of Hypnosis in Dentistry. And one of the really interesting things is dentists have a really good understanding of why hypnosis is important. So in the 40s and the 50s and even into the 60s, many dentists across America were using hypnosis because I think more than any other professional, people are afraid of dentists. Right. And if, Absolutely. if, if sure. they could use something that right. could help people put whatever fears they have to rest, then they'll show up in their office. So mm -hmm. it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. You need those procedures and they get to have a living. Right. So that's the first book I wanted to share with people because when, when people think or, or perceive that hypnosis is something new, that's something that just came about maybe in the 21st century, now this is a thing. This has been a thing for a very long time. Uh, I always like to let people know that the British Medical Association okayed hypnosis in 1955. Uh, Pope Pius XII, yeah. the, the, yeah. the Vatican, identified hypnosis as something valuable for people in 1956. The AMA accepted hypnosis in 1958. So that's that's something that all of our uh, watchers should know. Fascinating, yes. This is another book that I wanted to bring people's attention to. As I said, the first book was written by a dentist. Mm -hmm. This book is written by medical doctors. Mm -hmm. And it covers all of the different kinds of maladies and issues that one would, again, think about going to a, a doctor for, whether right. it's a burn, whether it's cancer and so forth. And they're using hypnosis as an adjunct. So medical hypnotherapy doesn't replace any kind of uh, conventional medicine, but it does work in conjunction with conjunction. it quite well. Fascinating. The last book very, I'd very like to share with your, with your viewers is a book called Hypnosis House Calls. Now, this book was written in 2011, so it's a fairly new book in, in context of these others. But this book was written by a psychologist, and it really inspired me in a lot of ways because the title alone, H H House Calls. In the olden days, doctors made house calls. calls. That doesn't sure. really happen anymore. No, I remember that. I can remember that. Sure, I had, I I had a pediatrician that would come to our house when yes. I was very little. So I, uh, I started making house calls with hypnosis to patients in the tri-state area. I would go to Connecticut, I would uh, get on the train, go down to New York City, different parts to work with expectant mothers using hypnosis. So that's one of my specialty areas is working with natural childbirth. It's something that I've loved for a very long time. I held myself back from it because I felt like that was something that women should do. Sure. But I feel sure. now really empowered to do the work. Right. So I would go and help the women before they gave birth, and I would help them after they had already had their babies because there were a lot of needs yeah. that they had afterward. Yeah. So house calls is something that I started to do myself. And I actually received an award. I received a few different awards in the field of hypnosis. But the most recent award was in 2017 for the most unique contribution in one of the organizations that I belong to. And that was actually taking hypnosis into people's homes, which no one's really doing. And it, it, it's great. It's a wonderful service to be able to offer. Oh, it, it, it's so fascinating, absolutely fascinating um, what you've shared today, and it was such an honor that you could share this with my viewers. Um, thank you so much. You're so welcome. For taking the time to be here. Um, well, I'm truly. glad we met. Oh, it's a pleasure. I learned so much today. <laughs> Remember, when you eat well and select great foods and feel great, and something you want to do for the rest of your life, and as Ajamu says, Think about our mind, both body, body and spirit, total self. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.